So you've had the opportunity to look at the fruit of the Spirit the past couple of months. And today, we will complete it by looking at self-control. But let's not forget the context of where we find this in the book. You know, last week, Billy did a good job of explaining the context of Galatians. I highly recommend listening to it if you haven't. But Galatians, Paul writes this letter to rebuke those who started believing that circumcision was required in addition to faith in Jesus to be saved. And by circumcision, the implication was that you had to keep the Mosaic law. But this was a fatal flaw, according to Paul. And in Galatians 4, sorry, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, which should be on your screen here, we see that Paul says that you are severed from Christ if you seek to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. This is the central theme of the book of Galatians. It is not by law, but it is by grace. And in verse 5, Paul writes, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Our righteousness does not come from keeping the law, but through the Spirit, by faith, in Jesus. This is what Paul has explained in the last four plus chapters. He has shown how the law is done away with because of what Jesus did and because of God's plan in how the law was supposed to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus and in his ministry. And then he also shows who we are in Christ. But now he turns. He turns to tell us, in light of all that, how are we supposed to live? And this is the place where we find the fruit of the Spirit listed. So let's read from Galatians 5, 13 to 26. It's not on your screen, so if you can grab a Bible from the pew, or if you have your own Bible, you can follow along. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul says that you are free from the law, but that does not mean that you can live your lives in a lawless way. Instead, through love, we are to serve one another, and that is the fulfillment of the law. And Paul is not being vague about these two things. You're free from the law, don't abuse your freedom, but live by the Spirit. He's not being vague about it, but in fact, he's actually giving us more information. He says, first, do not use your freedom to gratify the desires of your flesh. This is how you abuse your freedom that Christ has given us, by gratifying the desires of the flesh. Instead, he says, don't do that, and he gives you a list of things that, you sh that should not be evident in your life. Instead, he says, serve one another through love. 
And in that, he, it, and when he's talking about serving one another through love, that is where he lists the fruit of the Spirit. So basically, Paul is telling Galatians and us today, because of what Christ has done, and because of who we are in Christ, our lives should not be characterized by gratifying the desires of our flesh. Instead, it should be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit through love. I want to remind you that, the, that these are called the fruit of the Spirit. And it is important to keep that in mind because we cannot produce this in ourselves. It is the fruit of the Spirit. These are produced by the Holy Spirit in us. And even though it is the Holy Spirit who is the agent of work, but it is the work of the entire Godhead. It is the Father, Son, and Spirit producing this in us, conforming us to the image of his Son. And the triune God can produce this in us through the Spirit because he himself embodies each of these characteristics. Think about it. You know, we cannot produce it in us, but it is produced in us by the Spirit, which means God, the Spirit, must have it in himself to produce it in us, right? So, but it is manifested in us, and it is seen and evident, evident uh, through our lives. So here is our takeaway for this morning. Become self-controlled, for God is self-controlled. You know, you could say this about any of the characteristics in the list. You could say, become loving, for God is loving. Or, become faithful, for God is faithful. But since we are on the topic of self-control this morning, our, point, our main takeaway is, become self-controlled, for God is self-controlled. And if you are taking notes, we will see this by asking three questions. The first question, what is self-control? It is important to define it first, and we will do this biblically. Number two, question number two that we will ask is, how is God self-controlled? We said God possesses self-control. How is it that he possesses self-control? And we will also look at it through his word. And number three, we will see how we can become self-controlled. What are the ways through which self-control can be produced in our lives? So, number one, what is self-control? You know, whenever we think of self-control, we often conflate it with self-denial. You know, self-denial and self-control, these are two things that the Bible says should be characteristics of Christ's followers. But these are not the same, and we will look at it through uh, how the Bible uses them to understand what the difference is. The biblical definition of denial is disownment. The biblical definition of denial is disownment. It is to affirm that one has no acquaintance or connection with someone. You know, I want us to look at a couple of verses to understand this. First, let's look at Mark 8.34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And again, if you continue reading in, 30, in verse 35, he equates denial to losing your life. And in verse 36, he says, you have to forfeit your soul. Jesus' command to deny yourself is to disown your life. Disown your life and cling to him. Do not hold on to yourself. Disown it. And again, in Luke 12, 9, Jesus says, and this is in context of saying, if, uh, in verse 8, actually, he says, if you acknowledge me before men, then I will acknowledge you before men. And in verse 9, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So if we deny Jesus, if we disown Jesus before men, Jesus says that he will deny us. He will disown us. So the definition of denial is disownment. But self-control is not that. Self-control is different than denial. The biblical definition of self-control is to stay within bounds. John MacArthur defines self-control as holding oneself in. Stay within bounds, holding oneself in. And we see this first in 1 Corinthians 7, 9. The verse should be up here. 
But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Obviously, the context of this passage is with respect to marriage, right? And he says, if a person cannot control themselves, then let them get married rather than burn in passion. So keep your passion within control, within bounds. But if you're not able to do that, get married rather than burning in passion. He doesn't say, disown your passion, right? That's not what he says. He says, keep it in control. And again, in Titus 1.8, the verse should be up there, but I'm not going to read it. It's, the idea here is to be restraining or curbing. The elder of a church should be self-controlled. If we move on to another verse, 2 Peter 1.6, Peter is telling his readers to supplement their knowledge with self-control. He's talking about the knowledge of what God has done, of the grace he has given. And he says, supplement this knowledge with self-control. Do not let your lives be concerned about things, but with the knowledge that you have of who God is, live within that knowledge. Let your minds, let your thinking be shaped by that knowledge. Let your lives be characterized by the knowledge that you have gained. Stay within the knowledge that you have gained and not worry about things. On the other hand, if you look at Paul, Paul says, knowledge puffs up. So if you have knowledge, keep it, keep, be self-controlled about it. Don't be an annoying Kate stage Calvinist. Curb your enthusiasm. You know, and that's how, we, that's how we use control in our lives also. When you see a car driving within the lane, right? It's perfectly within the lane, and you say, okay, the driver is in control. But if you see a car going all around, going from this lane to that lane, and just out of control, and you say, yes, the driver is out of control. He needs to stay within the lane, right? And think about speed limit. If the, if the driver is just... Uh, driving rashly, like the guy's out of control. You know, I work in a medical device company, and we use a lot of statistics. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but one of the tools that is commonly used in manufacturing, it's called statistical process control. It is used to identify if a manufacturing process is in control or out of control. And you can see this first image here. It is the image... of a process that is in control. All right, maybe we don't have it. All right, so the process that is in control, every statistical process chart has an upper limit and a lower limit, right? So you have the upper control limit and the lower control limit. And if you see the data, if it falls within those limits, you're like, okay, the process is in control, you know? But if you start seeing the data going out of those limits, that's when you're like, oh, what's going on here? The process is out of control. We need to do something about it. And that's where you start getting parts that don't meet what they're supposed to do. So even in corporate America, corporate world, we use limits to define what is in control and what is not in control. So the definition of self-control is staying within bounds. Now, can we take this definition of staying within bounds and apply it to God? Can we say God is self-controlled? Essentially, we're saying we're putting limits on God. And that is a scary proposition. Which leads me to my next point. How, or next question, how is God self-controlled? So how can we place limits on God to say that he, is, that he stays within these bounds? What are these limits? How could we even define it? I mean, we saw how God is the creator of everything, right? Everything he has created. How can anything in creation limit him? How can anything put, keep him within bounds? It's unimaginable, but thankfully, thankfully, God has revealed it to us to what his limits are. And his limit his, is his own nature. God is limited by who he is. 
And he has revealed to us his nature through his acts and his words written down in the Bible. You know, unlike gods of many other religions, the triune God of the Bible is not capricious. He is not reckless. You know, in Islam, Allah can deceive, as in the crucifixion of Jesus, and or even suspend his law if needed. In Hinduism, the deity can have an incarnation in which he is true to one woman, and then he can have another incarnation in which he is a playboy and he can enjoy multiple women. Now, there is no way of telling if the deity is one way or another way. There is no bounds. But the God who created the heavens and the earth, the only true God, he is always true to his nature. He is the ultimate truth and therefore he cannot lie. He is the most holy one and therefore he cannot be tempted by evil. You know, there's so many times we say God can do all things. But no, there are things that God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot grow in knowledge because he is perfect. He knows all things. He cannot be unfaithful. You know, in 2 Timothy 2.13 We read, if we are faithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. You know, God cannot deny himself. God cannot disown himself. He stays true to who he is, and that is something that we can trust in the God of the Bible, in the way he has revealed it to us. He is always true to his nature, and he's revealed his nature in what we, earlier, what we read earlier also in Exodus 34, 5, and 7, Five to seven, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, this is the nature of God that he is revealing to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is the nature of God, gracious, abounding in mercy. And he never changes. He is who he is, as he revealed to Moses. He is who he is. He never changes. There are many places in the Bible where we see the immutability of God or the unchangeability of God. In Malachi 3.6, God himself says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God is always true to his nature. He stays within the bounds of his nature. He never changes. He cannot deny himself. And this is not a hidden truth in the Bible. You know, we see a lot of people in the Old Testament pray to God based on his nature. You know, they don't pray God, look, God, I've done this, I've done that, so, you know, please be merciful to me. No, they pray to him according to his nature. Moses, after the golden calf incident, he goes up to God and God is burning with anger against the Israelites. But Moses pleads with God and, what, and the way Moses pleads with God is he reminds God of the promises he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he says, God, you promised that you will take them into the land of Canaan. You promised that you will make numerous the offsprings of Abraham. And God cannot not keep his promises. God does not destroy the, the Israelites because of his promises. And also, again, in many Psalms, we see David crying out to God, and especially in Psalm 51, if you look at it, after David's sin is revealed, David cries out to God to have mercy on him, not because, God, you promised me all these things. You said my offspring would be on the throne. No, that's not what David uses to plead to God. God says, Lord, have mercy on me according to your loving kindness, according to your great compassion, not because of anything in me, but Lord, based on your nature, because of who you are, have mercy on me. And God stays true to his nature and has mercy on David. In Psalm 25, 6 and 7, again, David cries out, Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. 
Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. And this is the confidence that we also have that God is true to his nature and we can approach him and tell and expect God to act according to his nature, to be within his nature. But you know, the greatest display of God's nature and his self-control, his self-restraint, his holding himself in was seen on the cross. When, when the Son of God, Jesus Christ, suffered and died bearing our sins upon himself. You know, Jesus knew he was going to be crucified. He knew he was going to be put to death. But he did not run away from it. You know, in John 12, 27, we see Jesus praying to the Father, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify me. Jesus knew that he could, that this is what he came for, and he stayed within the plans of God. And again, in John 18, 37, Jesus tells Pilate, Pilate, for this purpose I came to the world, to bear witness to the truth. And being crucified was the crux of his ministry. You know, it's easy for us to think, look at the cross and say, why did Jesus do that? He could have come down. You know, when people were mocking him and saying, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. You who healed everyone, heal yourself. You know, they, could, they were crying out. And it's easy for us to think, yeah, Jesus could have come down. But no, Jesus could not have come down. If he had come down from the cross, then he would have denied himself. He would have denied all the promises God made through the prophets. And he would have gone out of his nature. Jesus could not have come down on the cross, and Jesus knew it. He said it was necessary. He told the disciples in Matthew 16, 21, it was necessary that he go to Jerusalem. And again, after resurrection, when he's walking with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he says, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things? It was necessary because God had promised that this would happen. And God is true to his promises. He does not change. He does not deny himself. He is true to himself. You know, Peter, Satan, through Peter, tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross. He said, no, Jesus, you should, should not be that way. I will never let that happen. But Jesus rebuked him and said, no, get behind me, Satan. There is no way that God will not keep his promises. He will stay true to his nature all the time. And the reason that this was necessary for him to go to the cross is because our representatives in the Garden of Eden, Adam, Adam and Eve, they did not exhibit self-control. You know, God told them, you can do whatever, but don't eat, of the, don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. God put a limit. Don't go beyond this. But they were not self-controlled and they went beyond that limit and they ate of the tree. And consequently, they ended up in a state of non-control. If you're not a Christian, we're glad that you're here this morning and or are listening to this message. The fact of the matter is that you can attest to this yourself, that you are in a state of non-control in your life. God has placed within us his limits, his law. And our consciences bear witness to the fact that we are out of his limits. You know, we have inherited the state of non-control from our representatives, the sinful nature because of the fall. We have inherited that. And every desire of our heart is evil. We do not desire God or his ways. We are prone to gratify the desires of our flesh, as Paul says. And because of this, we are eternally separated from God. But God did not leave us in that state of non-control. He sent his son, Jesus, being God who was rich in his love and mercy. He sent his son, Jesus, who took on the form of human beings. And he was tempted in every way that we are. Yet Jesus did not go out of God's limits. He did not sin. He did not commit a sin at all. He stayed within God's 
laws. He showed perfect self-control. He took on our sins upon himself and died on the cross. But God raised him up on the third day according to his word, according to his promises. Jesus said, I will rise up on the third day. And he did because God is true to his promises. He's true to his nature. And all, and all those now who call upon his name in him, we become rec reconciled to God. We become his friends. We become his children. And we obtain an inheritance. And the inheritance that we receive is God himself. It's not money, wealth, health, or anything. The inheritance that we receive is God himself. God says that he has, he has given us his Holy Spirit. And through his Holy Spirit, the triune God dwells within us. And because of the triune God dwelling within us through the Holy Spirit, he can produce the fruit in our lives. Which brings me to my third point. How can we become self-controlled? Number one, we can become self-controlled only with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelling in us is the one who produces the Spirit. So the question is, is the Holy Spirit indwelling in you? If you're a Christian, the answer is yes, the Holy Spirit is indwelling in you. We read in Romans 5.5 5, that God has poured out his spirit into our hearts. And in Ephesians 1.13 and 14, the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment of the inheritance that we will receive because of God's promises. Think about it. The Holy Spirit is the down payment. What do you do with the down payment? When you go to buy a car or when you go buy a house, you put a down payment. But if you go back on your promise, you lose your down payment. So if God is not going to keep his promise, what happens to God? He will lose the down payment, who is the Holy Spirit. How can that be? That can never be. So the Holy Spirit living in us, the promise of the Holy Spirit in us is God's down payment. And that is assurance that God will not go back on his promises. But if you're not a Christian, the call goes out to you today, as Peter cried out, on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelling in us is the one who produces the fruit. But we are commanded to walk by the Spirit. In Galatians 5.16, Paul says, walk by the Spirit. And in Galatians 5.25, he says, keep in step with the Spirit. And again, in Ephesians 5.18, Paul tells, be filled with the Spirit. You know, the culture within popular Christianity has made this filling of the Holy Spirit a very mystical experience. You know, you need to be one of the super apostles to be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, nothing can be further from the truth. We see that everyone who has placed their trust in Jesus, who has put their faith in Christ alone, is given the Holy Spirit. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is a command, but it is a passive command, as in you are receiving the Holy Spirit. You are yielding to the Holy Spirit. You are being receptive to the Spirit's words to, through, through the written word of God. And as we walk with the Spirit, He will produce the, the, spirit, the fruit of love, joy, peace, and even self-control within us. Number two, which uh, the way we can become self-controlled is by putting to death the desires of our flesh. You know, Billy, Billy said a lot about this last week, and again, please go back and listen. I just want to build on that by saying that, we are, that just as we are called to walk by the Spirit, we are also called to put to death the desires of our flesh. You know, in Romans 8.13, Paul tells us, put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. There is a classical book called The Mortification of Sin, which expounds more on this verse. If you haven't read it, please do read it. It's called The Mortification of Sin, and it gives you great detail on how you can, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh. 
Another verse that gives us great instruction on, gratify, uh, on not gratifying the flesh is Romans 13, 14. You know, it says, um, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Other translations says, make no plans for the flesh to gratify its desire. You know, this forces us to look at the plans that we make. What are our plans? Is the plans that we make to gratify the desires of our flesh? I've done that. I've done that many times. I planned to please my flesh. And a very simple example is to go binge out on a buffet. You know, we need to eat, but we're not called to be gluttonous. And I've made plans. I'm going to go to this place and I'm going to eat, eat to my heart's content. Amen. <laughs> yeah. So, so think about the plans that you make. Think about the plans that you make. Are you making plans to gratify the desires of your flesh? Every day in our lives, what are the plans that we make? We're going to go to this place. We're going to talk to this person. This is how we're going to do it. How does all of our plans match up against what Paul tells, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Instead, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Check your plans to see if you're gratifying your flesh. And finally, to become self-controlled, we need to have checks in our lives that will keep us within God's limits. You know, as we didn't see it, but in the statistical chart, you have an upper control limit and a lower control limit. And those are limits. And as long as you're within those limits, you are in a state of control. And it's the same thing for us as we walk our Christian life. We need to have limits within which we are supposed to live so that we are exhibiting and showing self-control. What are these limits? The first one is obviously the Word of God. The Word of God is God's direct word spoken to us. And He tells us, this is what I want you to do. This is God's revealed will. So stay within the bounds of His will. Let's get immersed in the Bible. Let's have these markers in our life and let's know them. As, jo as uh, God told Joshua in Joshua 1.8, Remember the words of this book and do not depart from it to the left or to the right. No, and let's not just be hearers of the word, but let's also be doers of the word. Let's not just be readers of the word, but let's also be doers of the word. Let the word that we are reading, let the exhortations and uh, commands and all the warnings that we receive in the Bible, let that guide our lives. Let that be limits for us as we walk this Christian life. Number two, uh, be a part of the body of Christ. You know, we're not called to be Christians all by ourselves. No, God is saving a people. He has a plan. And the plan that he has is to unite us to his body. Become part of the body of Christ. Become a member of a Bible-believing, gospel-proclaiming church like this one. Where you can, ha you can have brothers and sisters who will be those markers for you. They can see your life and they can encourage you or they can admonish you. If you are straying off the limits, they can admonish you and that is what the body is supposed to do. They will build you up and they will grow with you. Number three, do not forsake the gathering of the body of Christ. This is a direct command from Hebrews. Do not forsake the body of Christ. If you are forsaking the gathering of the body of Christ, then obviously you are out of limits already because you're out of limits of what the Bible is telling us to do. But be here. Be here on Sundays or whenever you meet and encourage one another. Pray for your fellow members. You know, it's, it's not easy going through this life and we all need prayers, right? Pray for those who are struggling. Pray for everybody in your church. If you have a church directly, pray through the directory. Pray for your fellow members. And finally, have an accountability partner in your life. You know, it's, it, it seems like very old-fashioned to have an accountability partner. But no, this world has so many temptations 
that just appeal to please our flesh. And, and we are so vulnerable because of the weakness of our flesh. Have an accountability partner whom you can call on when you are vulnerable, when you are weak, when you're being tempted. And you can call on them and they can pray with you and you can get with them and you can grow with them. Have an accountability partner. Have markers in your life so that you stay within control. And these are just a few of them, but there could be others in your life. And you know what markers work for you and what, what don't. Now get rid of the TV. Get rid of social media. You know, there's so many things that we can do in our lives to stay within what God wants us to be, to be loving, to be gentle, to be, uh, to be kind. You know, in conclusion, I want to say that Paul, again, is writing this letter to the Galatians, and he's writing against those who are advocating the works of the law in addition to faith in Jesus. And he has said, no, if you seek to be justified by the law, then you are severed from Christ. But Paul says that we can fulfill the law through love by serving one another. And we can do that when we walk in the Spirit, when we keep in step with the Spirit. And when we do all these things, the last part of verse 23, there is no law against these things. You know, we don't need a law because we, but because through the Spirit, we're walking in the, through the Spirit and we're walking in step with the Spirit. And by that, we will fulfill the law. And this is the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament where God told Moses, uh, or Moses prophesied, that God will restore his people and God will circumcise their hearts. Or Jeremiah, when he prophesies about the new covenant, and he says the law will be written in their hearts and there will be no longer any need to be, for, for the law to be taught. And this is what happens when the Spirit dwells in us, when we yield to the Spirit, when we walk in step with the Spirit, when we do not gratify the desires of our flesh, when we look to God who is self-controlled and we strive to be self-controlled by walking according to His Word, by keeping in step with the markers that He has given us. And I pray that this will be true of all of us as we walk our Christian lives.